The Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. We're going to be talking about uh, the Holy Spirit this morning, and um, every year in Confirmation, we go through the small catechism, and that is uh, Martin Luther's explanations on the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. And when I was a kid going through Confirmation, I think this stuff just went right over my head uh, when, when all of a sudden I'm reading about what Luther says the Spirit is. And so I want to read it to you because when I was in seminary, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That sounds interesting. Or that would preach. So here it is. Um, Martin Luther says in the third article of the Creed, which is, I believe, in the Holy Spirit, says, what does this mean? I cannot, I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. I'm going to read that again because this confused me. I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. The Holy Spirit has enlightened me with gifts and the Holy Spirit has sanctified me and kept me in true faith. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to even have faith in Jesus. I don't, on my own ability, have it to be able to fully believe in Christ, but the Holy Spirit working through me does. That's such good news, because I don't know about y'all, but I'm not a perfect person. And that's really great to know that the Spirit makes that faith access so wonderful. So today we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. We're right in the middle of it. Last week we got the first part of it, but I think it's important to know where we're at before we get to this conversation on the Spirit. See, this is the day before Jesus is going to be arrested and taken away, beaten and crucified, and resurrection happens. But this is the day before. And in the Gospel of John, in the 13th chapter, they have his Last Supper, which is different from the other Gospels where he's breaking bread and passing it around and drinking wine, and this is my body, this is my blood. In the Gospel of John, the Last Supper is whenever he takes that towel and wraps it around his waist. You know that story, right? And he kneels down and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. And he's not doing this because they have dirty feet. He's doing this because it's a form of service that even the slaves would be the ones that would be serving others doing this. So here he is taking the form of a slave to truly devote everything that he is in service to these disciples. And they are confused. They are worried about what's going on. Why is Jesus talking this way? Why is Jesus serving us this way? And then he looks at them and he says, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. And the way to love each other is in these wonderful acts of self-sacrificial service that he's showing them. So these disciples are hearing him talk about his death, hearing him talk about his arrest that's coming up, all these things that are happening. Now he's on his knees washing their feet, telling them to love one another, and they're kind of at, at odds with each other, questioning what's really going on. And that's whenever he talks, like we heard last week, do not be afraid. Where I'm going, you're going to go there too. It's my father's house. There's so many dwelling places. And Pastor Heather gave a great sermon on that last week. Go look it up on YouTube. Um, um, all these wonderful places. What's your favorite room? I remember that, yes. Um, so here is, here is Jesus saying, in my father's house, there's all these dwelling places. And, and don't worry, I'm going to come and get you and take you there so that where, where I am, you will be also. And you know the way, it's through me. And in fact, while you're waiting... 
just know that you're going to do greater things than I ever did because you've got this wonderful way to love each other with service. And so now the disciples are sitting there wondering what's going to happen in the days ahead. Jesus has said he's going to leave. He's washed our feet. We're supposed to love one another. And now he's talking about um, uh, uh, we're going to do greater things. He says, but you're not going to be alone. Keep my commandment to love one another. You're going to have the Holy Spirit with you. This is the advocate. So he uses this great word advocate. It means practically the same thing as the way we would use it today. An advocate is somebody that speaks on behalf of another. Think of a CASA volunteer here in San Antonio. An advocate is one that speaks for the, 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 the ones that don't have the voice, providing a voice for those that maybe they can't speak up for themselves. So in other words, this advocate will speak for you when you don't even know what to say. In other translations, it says, I will give you the comforter, which is a beautiful, beautiful image of somebody that provides us comfort when we're feeling uncomfortable or feeling anxious or out of sorts, that the Holy Spirit will comfort us in ways that even mom or a cozy bed can't do. In another version, it says a helper, somebody that's going to come to our aid. But my favorite is from the Greek, and it's the word for Holy Spirit, and that's paraclete. Everybody say it. Paraclete, not parakeet. In seminary, I reminded myself what it was because I was imagining I was going out to buy soccer shoes. I was going to buy a pair of cleats. There you go. Hey, you're going to remember it now. Yeah. Uh, so the paraclete, the definition of that is one that walks alongside with you. Oh, isn't that great? So here is the Holy Spirit that Jesus is gifting to these disciples, saying, you're not going to be alone. You're not going to be orphaned. This person is going to be with you. This is the Holy Spirit. It's going to walk alongside with you. It's going to help you in your time of need. It's going to comfort you in your distress. It is going to speak for you when you have no words. And this is going to help you do those greater things, which is loving others through service. What a great gospel that we've been given. And the disciples really took this and ran with it. So Paul, you remember him? He was Saul, then was Paul. We talked about him in confirmation this past week. And in Corinthians, he's writing to a group of people that are just at odds with each other. They're bickering. They're, they're complaining with each other. They're, they're saying, oh, these people aren't Jewish. These people are Jewish. These people are eating meat. They're not eating meat. They're doing it when they're not supposed to do it. They're sacrificing things. And they're just complaining back and forth. And he's writing to people that have just really become morally corrupt. And his message at the center of it all is love. You remember that from the 13th chapter. You probably had it at your wedding. Faith, hope, and love abides. But the greatest of these is? Very good, Lutherans. Yes. So this, this love is at the center. But he says it like, you know, if you're just sitting around waiting for people to listen to you, you're just like a person that's banging a gong, you're just crashing cymbals, you're just drawing attention to yourself. You're not loving the other person. You're just loving the self. He says, if you're going to eat this meat, and if it's going to cause problems for the other person, that's not loving them. Don't do it. So it's not about black and white rules. What's right and what's wrong is use that love as the, as the, as the metric, as, as the measuring stick. If what I, is what I'm doing, is it, is it helping somebody or is it harming somebody? Because I'm called to love them. I'm called to serve them like, like a servant with a towel wrapped around my waist. And if I'm not doing that, then maybe I'm actually harming them. I like to think of it in other denominations. They, they view communion different. This table's open. Everybody in here can have communion at any time, at any worship service you come to. It's never closed off. You, it's your table. That's not the same way it's viewed in other places. And if I go into other churches that have a different understanding of it, and I take communion there, I can actually harm them. Why would I do that if I'm going to cause harm? That's not loving other people. I mean, this never happens because I work on Sundays, but you get the idea, <laughs> right? So Jesus has given us the Spirit. The Spirit is there to walk with us. It's there to help us, to comfort us. It's help to, to show us how we are to love others in service. And we have an opportunity today to actually do that. Some of you all will find in your pew backs this 23 and APLC brochure. There's more out there, but more so there's a QR code in the announcement page for you to scan that so that way you can sign up for different things at church. What is your interest? 
But the way I want you to do this is not just look down there and say, oh, I like cooking breakfast. No, I want you to talk to the spirit that's within you. And let that spirit guide you. Because maybe there's things in here that might interest you that you never knew you wanted to do. Maybe you want to find out more about Stephen Ministry. Maybe you want to sit in the back and do sound and media. Maybe you want to join one of these amazing choirs that we've already heard today. Maybe you want to be a part of the instrument ensemble. We're, we're looking for trumpet players, y'all. <laughs> Maybe there are things that you have that you are gifted with, that the Spirit has gifted you with. So I want you to talk to the Spirit and let that Spirit guide you to make the decisions that you make. Let that Spirit comfort you to know that you're not going to be alone doing it. Let that Spirit help you to make those decisions. But at the end of the day, let that Spirit walk alongside with you. That you're not alone in making these decisions. In fact, the decisions that you make here at Abiding Presence doesn't just help you. It's going to help everybody else in here. The cookies going to the courtyard, the ramps that get built, the community at large, Children's Bereavement Center. All kinds of places that can be helped because you are listening to what the Spirit is speaking to you. That is walking beside you to, be, to do service that is based out of love for one another. And I'm going to close with, with the second half of Martin Luther's explanation. Because the first part talks about me and, and the individual, but the last part talks about us, all of us. So I can't believe in Jesus and have faith in Jesus without the Holy Spirit. And then he says, in the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. This is the Holy Spirit. Calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole church on earth and keeps it united with Christ and the one true faith. And in this church, day after day, the Holy Spirit fully forgives my sins and the sins of all. And on the last day, this Holy Spirit is going to raise me and all the dead and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. And like a true Lutheran format, he closes with, this is most certainly true. But a better translation of that is, amen.